Hey, just so you know, we're gonna start in a few minutes, but there is tea and coffee at the back, uh, just at the back of the auditorium. If you want to get yourself a tea or a coffee, now's your chance. There they go. You didn't even notice. It's down the back, grab yourself a tea and coffee, and we'll be starting about five or ten minutes, alright?
Hello everybody, good morning. Hey, we're getting started real soon, so if you're getting a coffee, uh, come and grab your seat. If you haven't got your coffee yet, snooze you lose. It'll still be there at the end. Come and, come and grab a seat, we're gonna get, get cracking. Just give us another, another minute and we'll get straight into it, eh? Cool? Yeah. <laughs> 
Morning, everyone. Come and grab a seat if you haven't found one yet. I encourage you to shift forward if you're sitting far back. Come to the front. Get nice and close. That'll be really cool. Fantastic. Great to see so many of you guys out this morning. Thanks for coming out on a uh, Saturday morning. And uh, who just woke up like 15 minutes ago? Anyone? Just, yeah, all the, all the teenagers. Yep. Fantastic. Well, we, we really have a, a great, <clears throat> just privilege and blessing to have Pastor Matt Field here with us. He's, uh, he's began his journey in Australia, and um, most of his time was with Planet Shakers Church there as a student pastor, and uh, <laughs> grew a uh, significant student ministry of, of over 3,000 students, a lot of them overseas students, and uh, during that time developed a real heart for Asia, and in particular Malaysia, felt a real call of God there. And so over the last few years, it's been a journey of, of um, following the call of God, and he's now with Kingdom City Church in um, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and he is the uh, executive pastor, lead pastor there in Malaysia, so he's the man, and uh, they have multi-campus churches, uh, they're all around in Australia, and all um, planting churches all over the show. Over the last few years, they've just seen explosive growth going on there, and uh, they've, they're running like Every few months, they're splitting, doing another service, another service, planting churches, uh, just starting one in Singapore, and in a couple of months' time, just there's going mental, just seeing people get saved all the time. Just really cool, just hanging out with Matt and uh, just chat with him. I've known Pastor Matt for about four or five years now, and uh, he's, a, he's an amazing man of God, genuine, uh, loves the Lord, and uh, in Malaysia, it is a Muslim country, and so they, uh, he's facing some incredible cultural stuff stuff with the government, like, it's amazing, they have Muslims coming to Christ every week, they're seeing uh, people who are completely exiled from their family, from their countries, and uh, he was telling me the story of just one man, just the other day, uh, who comes up to me and goes, Pastor Matt, I'm a citizen of nowhere, like, this guy has, has uh, basically, he's come from Iran, he's ended up there, he's became a Christian, converted to Iran, was put in secret prison, had his legs broken there, uh, persecuted for his faith. Um, most of his friends have been killed for their faith. Uh, some are still in prison. He's managed to find his way to Malaysia. Uh, it turned out the passport he was on wasn't a real passport. They revoked that. Now he's just in Malaysia. He's got nowhere to go. He's got no passport. No, he's a citizen nowhere, but he's serving God and with Matt. And just, he's, he's, what was his words? Pastor Matt, I'm not afraid to die. That's right. Just awesome, man. Awesome. And uh, so they're just doing incredible things over there. Uh, I'd love to get over there one day and just see what God's doing there. It's just an amazing work. Um, but he shared last night with our youth, and we, uh, a, oh, we had 177 young people here, and 57 teenagers got saved last night. It was amazing. If you go on our Facebook page, I, um, I took a photo of the altar call, and it was packed. I looked behind me. Uh, so we invited, if you brought a friend and they got saved, ask them, would you like me to come down the front with you? And so they just flooded in the front. I looked behind me, there was like 30 kids left standing in their seats. I was like, oh, what were you guys up to? You know, like they just, but everyone was just packed in the front. Kids getting saved. It was just a, a powerful, powerful night. It was amazing. So we really, um, we got, I invited Pastor Matt to come because I really feel like as a church, 
we're on that tipping point for the next season, the next thing that God has for us. I really want to get something from somebody who is in the place that we want to be. And uh, if you to invest in our church, invest in our leaders, invest in our people, and I really want to invite you to lean in today and to capture something of Matt's heart, something of uh, what he carries so we can launch our church into the next season of what God has for us here. So how many of you know we ain't done yet? Like this is just to be like we are baby phases. I, I still always feel like we're still in the womb. We're still just developing, you know. And God has got some incredible stuff for us. And we've got to keep pushing out the walls. Man, is, as long as there's one person in this city that doesn't know Jesus, we've got to keep growing, man. So uh, if you don't like big church, you'll hate this church. I hate it. So let me just pray. And then I'm going to hand over Pastor Matt. He's just going to share with us for a few minutes. And, uh, and uh, take notes. Please take notes. We are live streaming, so it's going to go up on our live stream feed later on so you can watch it again uh, later on too. But let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for your hands on this church. We thank you for your call for each of us to be here. We thank you for your grace in this place. We thank you that you are changing lives every day and every week in this place. Thank you for the hearts and lives of people that are here. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, would you just, Holy Spirit, would you speak through Pastor Matt today? Would you speak through him and deposit in us what we need to get from, that he carries for our next season and our next step and our next stage as a church. God, we want to never be complacent. We never want to settle. We know there's always more. There's always greater. You're taking us from strength to strength. You're making us new every day. And so, Lord, we want to continue to look forward with greater vision for what you're calling us to do and be. And I pray this morning... What Matt shares, Lord, will just sit in our hearts. Lord, it will change us. We won't just hear it, but we'll be doers. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name you bless everything we do this morning in your awesome name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Can we just stand and just welcome Pastor Matt as he comes to share the word with us? Awesome. Can we just give Jesus Christ a bit of a cheer in this place? so good to see so many people turned up. Amen. I like it. It is currently, uh, it's almost six o'clock in the morning, Malaysia. So I'm never up at this time. So this is like miracles. Uh, I, got up, I got up at eight o'clock, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, four o'clock in the morning, Malaysian time. And uh, I'm still adjusting. You know, you go to bed last night. We had a great night last night at the youth. And uh, yeah, I've been put up in a beautiful hotel that has a very large spa bar. Uh, you know, often I, yeah, I used to travel a lot in the old days, used to do a lot of itinerant, and uh, I never utilised those things. But this time I utilised it. Hello. Last night after uh, we, we went and treated ourselves to some McDonald's, I had a hot chocolate. I just want to point that out, I had a hot chocolate. That's okay to drink, right? No. Pastor Steve had a... Ice cream cone with a flake in it. <laughs> and, he, and he gave me a hard time for hot chocolate. Right? Anyway, so, uh, but then I got home and then I suddenly saw this beautiful four seater spa bar. So I filled it. And, uh, and it actually has a heating element in there so it keeps the water hot. I mean, how, how good is this thing? Yeah. And I pressed the bubbles. The only bad part was I couldn't see the television from the spa bar. But I sat in that thing for at least an hour. It was good. And then I put on one of the robes, the bathrobe things they have. I haven't worn one of those things ever. I was just, I was living the life, man. I had some sparkling water on the side of my bed, peanuts, television. It doesn't get any better than that, folks. Living the dream. <laughs> Fell asleep, television was still on. And uh, I turned it off and went back to sleep. It was a good night. But uh, I, it's great to be back here. I, 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 I have come to Whangarei a couple of times. Uh, I came here. My first time was many, many, many years ago. And, uh, and then I came probably, I think, seven or eight years ago for another church. Uh, but uh, coming back here and seeing what God is doing is absolutely awesome. The youth, last night, the youth, that was just incredible. You know, that stuff, sort of stuff doesn't happen. One third of the congregation giving their lives to Christ. I mean, can you imagine running that sort of percentages every weekend? <laughs> I mean, that's what altar calls are designed for. You, you haven't got a big altar like this designed for small crowds to get saved. Yeah. You know, maybe we should just have a little thing like this if we're only expecting ones and twos. Just come down the front here and stand by the pulpit. Right? We've got a big altar, which means there's lots of people whose lives can be altered. Amen. So... 
but coming up here, I, I'm wearing a, I don't own jackets anymore. I mean, I live in a perpetual 33 degrees every day. Uh, Malaysia only has two seasons. It has hot and wet or hot and dry. And uh, so we don't have anything else, right? It's just, it's hot. And so this is actually not mine. This is a pastor from another church's that I spoke at who lent it to me and I didn't give it back. <laughs> That's how we accumulate things. So I'm just, I'm sussing out all Steve's gear right now to see what I can have. The hat's looking good. I like the boots. I think it's <laughs> the bag. Hey, I saw that bag. It's a hot bag. Awesome. But uh, it really is a, a privilege to come and speak to you. And uh, I, I do want to share some thoughts. You know, uh, we've been over in Malaysia since the beginning of last year. And God has done some incredible things. Uh, Pastor Steve shared a little bit about it. Uh, my passion for Malaysia it goes back 13 years. Of when I first started the student ministry way back in Adelaide. Uh, God gave me three international students, all from Asia. And it grew exponentially. Uh, it grew to 300 in two years. And uh, I got my first trip over to Malaysia, and it was a place where I prayed the prayer I've never prayed anywhere else. I asked God to break my heart for the people. Didn't pray that anywhere else. Always had a passion for lost people, always had a passion for people, but it was in that country that I said, I want you to break my heart. That's exactly what he did way back in 2000, and it got worse every year. Surrendered it every year, put it on the altar, because how many people know, unless a seed dies, it can't bear fruit. And uh, so every year it just got worse. He used to tell me, it's getting worse, you know. Uh, did the university ministry for Planet Shakers. It was 1,200 students when we left uh, a few years back. And, and I think 1,150 of those were Asians. Yeah, wow. And, uh, you know, uh, but uh, finally moved over to the promised land. And uh, we're over there. The church was around 650 people attending on a Sunday, uh, which was a healthy church, great church. Now, God's just done amazing stuff. We've grown, we have around 1,500 people attending on a Sunday now. Uh, God has just done exponential growth. As Pastor Steve was sharing, lots of people getting saved, lots of people's lives getting changed. It's not a white person's church. It is an Asian church, you know what I mean? There are a few token white people. I'm one of them, uh, even though I class myself as Albino Asian. Uh, but uh, God is doing great things, and there's nothing better than being in a place where God can grow you the most. Amen? I think sometimes we ask God to grow us, but then we tell him how we want to grow. Yeah, good. You know, God, listen, I need you to change these things. This is what I want to grow in, and this is the plan. Yeah. How do people know God's always got a better way? Yeah. He goes, listen, I, I heard the first part of the prayer, the second part I wasn't listening to. Yeah. Because it's not going to work that way. Amen? Yeah. Come on, we, we do pray prayers like that, don't we? God, I need you to provide for me, and this is what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay? Uh, isn't it good that God's God and we're not? Yeah. And, uh, and so this morning I want to talk to you uh, specifically about leadership and I've been doing my devotions uh, for the last month out of the book of Exodus. And uh, it's a great book to read. Uh, it's Lessons from Moses. Hang on a sec. Can someone pop that top now? I just had a great... I had a great workout with Pastor Steve yesterday. This man is incredibly fit. When he trains, people stop. <laughs> they just watch. But it was a great workout yesterday. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've been reading about Moses and, and lessons that I can learn from him. I mean, he was one of the great leaders of the Old Testament. Amen. I mean, the thing I love about Moses is Moses was actually very secure in his leadership. Yeah. Because if you read in Exodus, you'll find that he actually says this. He says, and Moses was the humblest man, perhaps the most humblest man on the planet. And Moses wrote that about himself. Because <laughs> he wrote the book of Exodus. Does anybody know that? He actually, Moses was a humble man. Can you imagine writing that? Yes, Matt Field, he was a humble man. In fact, he was perhaps the humblest man that ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> but there's a security in Moses' leadership. Amen? Yeah. And uh, thank God we were able to read about it and talk about it today. And I, I just want to take you through the book of, uh, the chapter 18 of the book of Exodus. I'm going to read from verse 13 through to verse 26. I'm reading from the NKJV, the New King Jimmy version. Is that okay? Yeah. You can call him Jimmy if you're friends with him. If you still don't know him, you can call him James. Yeah. It says this, And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do is not good. 
Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from them all the people, able, from all the people, able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such, of them, uh, such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they, shall, they that themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure. And all this, uh, all this people will also go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. You know, we see an incredible scenario here. I mean, here's Moses. He's led, uh, you know, uh, an incredible amount of people. Some theologians, they wrestle with it and say anywhere between one mil or one and a half mil. And of course, they, they, it's continuing to grow as they spend time in the wilderness. But uh, now Moses, uh, you know, he went, he went from obscurity to notoriety. In one appointment, he was made the leader of a million people. Wow. Think about it. He didn't even know God when he met God. He'd heard about him. Jethro, his father-in-law, told him about him. But until he had the burning bush experience, he didn't know God. He said, who are you? He asked the question, I'm the God of Abraham, the Isaac, and, and Jacob. And I've heard the oppression of my people, and I'm going to come and set them free. So Moses thinks, well, this is good. You're God. You can do that. And then immediately he appoints him to leadership. Behold, I'm sending you. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I love the fact that God's a risk taker, even though he's not a risk taker, because he already knows. Yeah. But there is an element of risk in there, right? From, from nobody... To all of a sudden a leader, a general over a million people in a flick. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? We've got to go through due processes, man. You've got to come to church for at least 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to know at least the first five books of the Bible and quote them backwards, upside down and all the ways around and praise accordingly and raise your hands appropriately in worship and then we might consider you. But here's Moses having an immediate appointment yeah. by God. To go and rescue his people. Isn't that incredible? I mean, there's a lesson to be learned just even on that. But, uh, I mean, we've got to apply wisdom, amen? Yeah. But there is an appointment there. But we see this, and now Moses is doing the right thing. He's actually looking after all the people. But I love it because his Jethro, his father-in-law, comes in. Instead of cheers him on, goes, what you're doing is wrong. Yeah. Amen. I mean, yeah, come on, man. Sometimes we want the right comment, but we don't get that comment. I'm doing all this stuff. Look at how, well, how powerful I'm doing stuff. This is incredible. And he goes, yeah, it's not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> See, what's happening is God's beginning to grow this community. More people are inquiring and asking things and there's matters coming on and that sort of stuff. There's problems going on with this big church, yeah? And how many people know as the church continues to grow, which is a healthy sign, by the way, too. Yeah, Anything healthy must grow. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? I don't believe there is anybody that has a mandate to maintain. Very good. I've never heard God ever say, well done, maintain. Yeah. <laughs> no, he said, grow. Right. In fact, nature teaches us that the moment a tree stops growing, it's already starting to die. Yeah. Amen. In fact, if a tree stops bearing fruit, it is cut down and thrown into the fire. And if you're bearing fruit, you get pruned. Yeah. So either way, you get cut. <laughs> but there's a good cut and there's a bad cut. Amen. And so what we need to understand is this, is Moses is in a situation, church is growing, it's got problems. Now how many people know a healthy church has problems? I was saying to Pastor Steve as we're driving, I said, you know, I never want to be a part of a church that doesn't have any problems. Because if you've got a church that doesn't have problems, you've got a problem. Come on, isn't that true or not, man? Everybody's just politically correct, no one's getting upset. Come on now, someone's surely going to be offended at least once in a while. I don't like that song. Or sing it anyway. Come on, bro. I only like the slow songs. I like the worship songs. The slow songs. How many people know worship is not a slow song? Yeah. <laughs> Praise is not a fast song. That's just our ideology. Yeah. Yeah. God just says it's just music, man. Sing. Either way, it's worship. Amen. Yeah. How high do I raise my hands? Oh, they're raising their hands way too high. Yeah. 
those dancers, those ribbon people. You know, I mean, all these confusions and all these conflicts and that sort of stuff there. Where's the prophetic word? And that sort of stuff. Now listen, I like all that sort of stuff. I'm not here to pay it out. I love the fact that we've got different personalities in this place. Thank God for that. How boring would it be if we agreed about everything all the time? Some people want deeper teaching. Some people want shallow. Listen, my figuring is this. If you can't swim in three feet of water, don't go to 30 feet. Amen. (laughs) Come on, man. Don't ask for deep when we can't even get win the lost. Yeah, That's about as shallow as it gets, and they're the processes that we need to deal with. But here Moses is dealing with the problems of the people. You know, and at the end of the day, we've all got that. You're all involved in leadership. Guess what? You asked for problems. Yeah. The moment you said, I want to get involved, you said, Lord, I'd like to deal with some issues. <laughs> you just didn't know you prayed that prayer. You thought it was just to get your name on the church bulletin board. <laughs> so Pastor Steve said, well, I just want to say a big thank you to such and such. And you're like... Praise God, no, it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. No need for thanks, you better thank me. No need for thanks, seriously. What you are really saying is when you become a leader is, God, I want to deal with people's problems. That's exactly what's going to happen. No matter what realm of leadership you're in right now, you're going to get it. Because the moment you ask to become a leader, you give up your right of being right. Isn't that a good thing? You give up. No, you don't say no. <laughs> There's an honest person in the place. No! I don't like it! But the moment you ask to become a leader, that's what you're doing. You're giving up your right of being right. You're not right all the time. People aren't going to like you. And you won't even do anything wrong, they won't like you. You're just a leader now. You've just become the target. You have to become the target. You're the leader. I don't like you! Just what happened? Just the same as you didn't like certain leaders as well. Well, you're reaping what you sow. <laughs> Come on, folks. How many of us have got rebellious people we're leading right now? What chances are you possibly were the same? <laughs> Come on, Jesus. Uh, the Bible says it. It says Galatians uh, 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Yeah. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to reap eternal pain from people. Right? But at the end of the day, some of the things are just because of the way we work. Right, But we can see it broken, we can see it changed, and we can see it developed, and we can see it discipled. Amen? That's the whole thing. And Moses is going through the same situation right now. He's looking after a massive church. And they're coming to him with the problems, right? But this is the thing. I want to talk to you about lessons that we've learned from Moses this morning. And first of all, I want to talk to you about Moses' problems. Now, it's not the fact that he's a bad guy. It's the fact that we get to read about it. Amen? This is the beauty of having the Word of God. You can learn from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen? And there were some things about Moses that we can look at here that Jethro even rebuked. And here we see Moses' problem. Amen? And when it comes to leadership, the biggest problem is this. The first problem is this. Is Moses thought he was indispensable. Okay? If you're a leader, you need to understand this. Moses thought he was indispensable. He's the guy sitting on the judgment chair judging a million plus people. He thought he was indispensable. Can I tell you, friends, listen. Nobody is indispensable. Nobody is indispensable. Listen, sometimes we think, well, no, this is it. This is what I do. I mean, no one else can do that, right? Unless I do it, it won't get done. Oh, you're already on a downward spiral. Start thinking those sorts of things. This Chinese proverb says this, man who say it can't be done. Sorry, is that not Chinese enough? Try it again. Man who say it can't be done. Needs to get out of the way of the man doing it. <laughs> That's a Chinese proverb. Man who says it can't be done needs to get out of the way of the man doing it. When you start thinking you're indispensable, unless I do it, not it won't get done. You're already thinking wrong. Okay, you're already robbing yourself. Esther, now listen, remember the story of Esther, Esther chapter four. Cousin Mordecai, Uncle Mordecai, he came up to Esther. He says, "Listen, baby, if you remain silent at this time." God will raise up another in your stead. But who should know that you've been called for such a time as this? See, what he was saying, sweetheart, God wants to use you. But if you don't do this, God will replace you. You are not indispensable. Amen? The moment we begin to think no one can do what I do, plenty of people can, and probably better. I remember one of the first camps I ever did as a young punk, I was speaking, and, and this youth kid comes up to me and goes, I'm going to preach like you. 
He's like 12 years old. I'm going to preach like you. And I said, I beg your pardon? No, you're not. I preach like me. And he goes, well, then I'm going to preach better than you. So I said, well, you better preach better than me. Because if I find out you're not, I'll kill you. Now, how many people know that's fun saying to a 12-year-old kid? But you know, I saw him nine years later. He was in Bible college. He was playing saxophone at a Youth Alive uh, rally that I was speaking at. And I turned around, I saw him, and he goes, you remember me? I said, I remember you, man. And he goes, I'm going to preach better than you. I said, you better. I'll carry your bags. I have no issue with someone doing it better. Do you understand? But we get caught up in these things when we think we're indispensable. We're already on a downward spiral. In fact, I believe in leadership. Our job is to make ourselves redundant. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm just simply holding on to the baton for my time. I don't want to drop it before time, but I want to pass it on the way a baton should be passed on. In a relay race, it doesn't just get passed to the person you stop. You actually run with the person for a while. Has anybody noticed that? You run, you pass the baton, and then you carry on running with them for a few moments to cheer them on. Sometimes we just go, that's it, I'm done. (laughs) And leadership. (laughs) Ridiculous. See, we need to understand. We get caught up in this. Moses thought he was indispensable. Please, friends, listen to me. No one's indispensable. Yeah. Yeah. No one is indispensable. It's, it, unless I do it, it won't be done. It's the greatest trap of leadership. Moses had a great sense of responsibility, but the problem is it expressed itself in control. He had a great sense of responsibility. God's called me to shepherd this flock. That's an awesome, awesome responsibility. That's ownership of the role. Does this make sense? But the problem was, it was manifesting in total control. Amen? Come on, some of us, we, 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 we want to control absolutely everything. Moses had his finger in everything that moved. And that's why Jethro said, this is not good. See, there's nothing wrong with you having your finger on the pulse. But there's a big problem if your finger's in every pot. Come on, am I making sense here? Yeah, as, as the senior pastor, Pastor Stephen, Pastor Beck, they, they need to know what's going on. But if they have their finger in every pot, they're going to grow old fast. Yeah. They're going to get tired and weary and everything. But if they know that there's delegated responsibility, then they, their things are going to continue to move on. And the problem is some of us, we want to control absolutely everything. Everything has to be checked and we grow, we grow a bunch of fragile people. Does this make sense? And see, these are the sorts of things that we learn from his, his style of leadership. See, the, the second thing about this is Moses was doing himself and his family wrong by just doing it all himself. He was doing himself and his family wrong. Moses was burning himself out. Jethro said, you're going to wear yourself out. The sad part that I find about leadership is people that drop out because they have become tired and weary. Amen. The Bible says that we're not unaware of the schemes of the devil, but we are. Because we still grow tired and weary. The Bible warns us plenty of times that that can happen. Paul said in Galatians, he said, do not grow weary in doing good. Why did he have to write that if we don't grow weary in doing good? He wrote it because guess what? We grow weary in doing good. I'm tired of doing good. I want to do bad. I want to come late to church. I want to look angry during worship. I want to go boo instead of amen. I want to park my car horizontally across the lines. I want to give the ushers a hard time. I want to swear. Are you kidding? Do you understand what I'm saying? We grow weary in doing good. Picking up that person every week. They never say thank you. One day we just want to drive straight past their house. <laughs> I'm not coming. You understand, right? Come on, I don't want to lead them anymore. Worship leaders just having a bad day. Everybody, worship! <laughs> shut up! Shut up! <laughs> I'm having a bad day. We grow weary. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, Isaiah 40 tells us there's even youths, yeah. us young people, <laughs> I turned 50 in January. 50, I'm a half century in only a few short months. The reason why I look this young is because of oil of Olay. <laughs> Even youths grow tired and weary. Even youths grow tired and weary. But they that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. 
That word wait is the word rest, by the way, too. Learn how to rest in his presence. Amen? Yeah. But this is the problem. See, you burn yourself out, and he was doing it wrong for himself and his family. He wasn't around with his family. Sometimes we get so caught up in leadership, your family begin to despise you. We've got to bring balance. My wife, she works full-time on staff with me at, at Kingdom City, and uh, she heads up massive stuff. But we are both each other's alarm bells. We let each other know. Hey, hey, come on. You're out all the time. Pull it in. Get a bit more discipline. Families end up resenting. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. When we were called to Malaysia, some people were used to, When I first felt called to Malaysia, you know, and this is a 13-year journey for me. People are going, well, when we finally said, we're going, we're leaving in 2012, we're leaving, end of the year, going to Malaysia. People are going, what does your wife think? And I went, oh, she hates it. <laughs> She's ready to divorce me. She hates my guts. How ridiculous. I mean, seriously, it's a family call. Yeah. My two daughters, my oldest is 19, my youngest is 16. Right, gorgeous girls. What do they think? They're in. Because yeah. I told them, we're not going until you say yes. I'm not forcing you to say yes. They would have submitted to me. But I said, sweet, that's unless you say. And my oldest man, she was my the youngest said, I mean, she has this worship experience with God. She goes, it's time, Daddy, let's go. I went, all right, but Emily, what about you? She goes, no, no, my friends are good. I said, don't worry about it. We're not going. We'll live here in Melbourne. We'll do what we're called to do. And we'll make things work. I'm not, we're not leaving until you're into it. And I'm not putting pressure on you. I just want you to pray, God, where do you want us to be? And when it, the moment came, she finally comes to me. She goes, Dad, it's time. Let's go. They are thriving in Malaysia. It's a family calling. Yeah, great, man. Amen. It's not Matt Fielder's calling. It's the Fielder family. Yeah, it's good, great, I lost this single identity the moment I said, I do. Yeah, it's, a, great, it's, a, it's a relationship, amen? Because then we can face whatever storm we face. Yeah. Because it's family you're called to it. Does this make sense? Yeah. And so in this was stuff, then Moses has sent his wife and kids off to Jethro. Jethro's brought them back. Yeah. Dude, your family. Yeah. Imagine Moses coming over. Oh, yeah, I had to go. Yeah, I cancelled a billion people. Tell someone else your problems, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Zephora. Can you imagine that? There would have been issues. So he was doing an injustice. Is this making sense? Yeah. Some of you I know I'm speaking to. He, you, you, you will wear out. You will neglect your family if you don't put these sorts of principles in. You need to learn these lessons from great men and women of God. Amen? Yes. Number three, Moses was setting a bad precedent for all the people of God. See, not only was he wearing himself out, but he was also wearing the people out. Isn't it amazing? Because Jethro didn't say you're just wearing yourself out. He says you're wearing all these people out as well. They're having a way all day to catch up with you. There's a wearing out of that sort of stuff there. See, you need to understand everything that moved had to go through Mo Moses. That's not a good principle, yeah. right? At the end of the day, you'll wear yourself out, but you'll also wear people out. Right. You know, people that want to catch up with me right now, sometimes they have to wait four weeks for an appointment. That could be four weeks too long, yeah. Yeah. right? Because if I'm trying to manage absolutely everything. Some people, you know, because you're the senior pastor, they want to see you because you're the only one who can handle their situation. And then they find out, when you finally catch up with them, you go, okay, what was the pressing matter? Should I wear the blue shirt? <laughs> or should I wear the green shirt to this appointment? And you go, okay, well, I don't care about that, but what was the problem? Now, that was the problem, right? <laughs> they kind of want senior pastor to do everything. Yeah. Right? How many people know that's impossible? Yeah, really. Amen? And so this is the thing. You'll wear people out because they're waiting all this time when someone else could have answered that question. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah. You know what I mean? You're doing an injustice. We're doing an injustice if we're trying to do it all ourselves. People underneath you uh, will get worn out because they won't be able to get the appointment. As your church continues to grow, one of the biggest problems you have is the seniors or the team times will be limited. Yeah, there's per that's where some people do want to stay in the confines of a small church because you have access to all the senior people all the time. Now, as much as that's wonderful and that sort of stuff there, in a church that's growing and healthy, that's not going to happen. Yeah. There has to be new appointment. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we have to accept that and we have to embrace that. Otherwise, we'll, we'll actually stunt our own growth. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. There's no way in the world that I'm the only person that can fix the problems at Kingdom City. Yeah. There's just no way. Yeah. Even Pastor Mark and Jemima, who are the senior leaders over the Kingdom City uh, movement, it's, we've got three campuses in Perth, we've got the one campus in KL, we've got a campus in Phnom Penh, and now we're just about to launch in Singapore. So I head up all the Asian region and uh, look after those things for Mark and Jemima. But listen, even Mark, Pastor Mark, he travels around and likes to speak at all the leadership, but we've had to, I've had to sit down with him and say, listen, 
you can't do this. You can't be at everything. You know what I mean? But he knows, and it's a passion. And I'll say to Pastor Steve, you know one of the greatest sacrifices in leadership is not taking out our earrings or stop drinking or stop smoking marijuana. You should have stopped that anyway, right? Uh, watching certain movies, that sort of stuff. They're not sacrifices, folks. Sacrifice is actually giving up the fact that you have, can't do some of the things in leadership that you love doing. Yeah. Going out on long appointments with people is not a luxury anymore. It's not available. I can't spend three hours with a person during the day. I don't have that sort of time frame. At the moment, it's maybe a 45-minute appointment if I can get you in. I don't, and I miss it. I love the days when I used to take four young punks out surfing all day. And I called that catching up. I called that pastoral care. I don't have that luxury anymore. It's a sacrifice because I love doing it. I used to love traveling around and speaking. I used to do a lot of speaking. But you know what? I must admit, God's taken away. But it was, at first it was like, you cut my arms off if you stop me from preaching at other churches. Yeah. But it was a sacrifice. Yeah, Does that make sense? Yeah. Sacrifice means it cost you something personally. Yeah. Some people say, I took my earrings out from leadership. <laughs> really? <laughs> Big deal. Just a piece of jewelry, for goodness sakes. Or maybe God challenges you to give up drinking. Now, I've got no issue with drinking. I'm not here to preach against it. In fact, the Bible even says a little wine's good for the stomach. Which means this. Uh... Okay, that was too deep. Did nobody get that little wine is good for the stomach? Okay, all right. You know, you try and crack a Christian joke every now and again. Right? Number whatever four, we don't joke out. Moses was ripping off those who may have been able to serve. By doing everything himself, he was stopping other people from serving. That's one of the deadly traits of a bad leader. Doing everything yourself, you're going to stop other people from rising up. You're actually going to set a bad impression for them because they're not going to want to rise up either. They're going to go, man, if that's what it takes to be a leader, you've got to work from morning to night. My God, burn yourself out. No, thank you. Who wants to sign up for that? Hi, I'd like to die young. You cap. By you doing absolutely everything yourself, you're stopping other people from rising up. Amen? It, it, you need us, and there's going to be people that can do it bigger, better, stronger, wider than you. That's a good thing. And if they do it under your discipleship, that means you're actually a great discipler. Yeah. Amen? We've got to be able to train those people up. But if we cap them, if we do everything ourselves, then you actually are locking people up, and it will stunt the growth of a church. Yeah. You know, I mean, people that run small groups and that sort of stuff there, but then when it's, the group's busting at the seams because it's grown, but you don't want to partition because they're my people. Yeah. Moses has to come in like he spoke to Pharaoh and speak to him and say, let my people go. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't want to leave. Yeah, trust me, someone will do. Yeah. See, the thing is, this is, you're, 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 it's just like, come on, folks, we can talk church, right? Yeah. Come on, we can pretend, but the truth of the matter is someone busting for an opportunity, they're not getting an opportunity because you've capped them. Yeah, right. Some of us run our groups and it's the, it's the one-man show. Yeah. You welcome everybody, you open up in prayer, you lead praise, you do announcements, you lead worship, you do the discussion, and then you prepare the food. Yeah. Welcome to my place. Yeah. When everybody else is just busting for an opportunity. Maybe to say grace or say a prayer or do the announcements or welcome people or even prepare the supper afterwards. And we're not giving them an opportunity because we're locking them up. And then they don't want to get into leadership because they figure, well, that's the way it's going to be. I've just got to do everything. I don't have that capacity. But we're stunting people's growth by holding on to everything. Does this make sense? Isn't it amazing? It's an oxymoron. You're doing everything yourself, but you're stunting people's growth. Isn't that bizarre that it actually works that way? So what's the solution? Moses' solution was a, a quick rebuke. You need to start bringing in delegation. Jethro said to him, you need to appoint, you handle the heavy matters, but the smaller matters you give to the other people. And he says, you should bring, uh, verse 22, it says, and let them judge, oh sorry, verse 21, moreover you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, uh, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, of hundreds, and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens, right? And let them judge the people at all times. In other words, what he was saying is you need to start sharing your responsibility. You, we have a famous saying, many hands make light work, but we don't appropriate it. All right? It really does. See, in other words, Moses needed to get some relief. Uh, the number one thing we understand about delegation is delegation actually allows for greater involvement. Yep. See, we want people to own the church. The way you own it is get involved. Yeah. 
You want people to own the involvement that you have in your connect group or home group or life group or whatever you call it here? Then you need to get people involved. They will take greater ownership. Amen? Does this make sense? We need to, it, it helps share the load. It helps lighten the load. You know, it gives us the ability as the leaders over something to begin to dream again. Because we're not focused in on absolutely everything. Does this make sense? You need to release yourself. I wonder how many of you right now, the thought of doing something new just feels like hard work. That's not the way it should be if you're a leader. You should have the freedom to be able to dream. You know, I'm doing, I'm heading up more now than I've ever headed up. I head up the whole of the church in Kaon, which is 2,300 people on our database, 1,500 people coming to church. Right? It's, like I said, it's grown exponentially, but I have more time to think now than what I ever did just running the university ministry and traveling and doing itinerary. Because I've got great leaders underneath me that actually help lighten the load, and I can actually sit in my office and dream. Get, come up with infrastructures, come up with more new thought processes, write programs or structures for new Christian courses and different things like this, and then call in my new Christian's pastor and go, these are some of the ideas I've been thinking about. Let's put them into motion. Let's, you start putting some more wheels to this. But it gives me an opportunity to begin to dream and strategize. When I think of Nom Pen and I have my Skype call with them every Tuesday for one hour, we start talking strategy, and I can start then afterwards just meditating and thinking about how can I make... How can I bring the best out of Dara, our youth pastor? How can I bring the best out of Pekaday, the guy who heads up Kingdom City, Nom Pen? How can I begin to develop him and, and build infrastructure into yeah, his yeah. life? Does this make sense? Yeah. But if I'm trying to do everything, yeah. I, thinking of those things, just like, oh, another bit of work I've got to get done. Yeah. Come on, am I making sense, folks? Yeah. If some of you just release some people in your connect group or your home group to say grace, you could have some relief. Yeah. Trust them with supper. I know they might just bring potato chips, but trust them anyway. We can always pray over the potato chips. Father, turn it into lamb chops. Does this make sense, guys? It gives us an opportunity. Delegation allows for greater involvement. It also allowed Moses to endure. Isn't it amazing? Jethro said, because then you will be able to endure. Leadership is not a three-year term. It's not a a one year, I'm going to try it out and then get burnt out at the end of it. Listen, when I signed up for leadership way back in 1987, a year year before I got married, I was in for the long haul. There were no backdoor options. It's like when Elijah began to follow Elijah. The Bible says that he went and he slaughtered the cows, the oxen, and he used the plowshare to burn and cook them. In other words, he got rid of his back door. He couldn't go back to his occupation because he killed it. Do you understand? Some of us, we go into leadership and go, if this doesn't work, I can always go back to plowing oxen. If this doesn't work in leadership, I'll just go over to this. I'll give give kids a ministry a go, but if it doesn't work, we go back to our back doors. Some of us just got to get rid of our back doors. Amen? Amen, If it doesn't work, it means it's not going to. If that thought process is already in your mind, you're already already destined to fail. It's not if it doesn't work, folks. We get into it for the long haul. Leadership isn't about liking everything either. Amen? Come on, man. If you want to be a leader in a church, you've just asked to work with the hardest commodity in the world. Greg was saying he works in IT. Was it Greg? Greg, you're working in IT? Craig. Craig. Craig works in IT. Much easier to work with IT than human beings. You can turn off a computer. You can't turn off a person. They'll just get you. You can't use an answering machine going, I'm sorry, I'm not here at the moment. But if you'd like to speak to me when I come back to my body, I'll return the favour. Right? You know, we deal, <laughs> we deal with human beings, right? It allowed him to endure. Too many leaders burn out. It wasn't because, listen to me, it wasn't because he was doing too much. It was because he was doing too much by himself. Yeah. There's a big difference. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I'm still doing a lot, but I don't do it by myself. Yeah. Amen? Some of us are just all by ourselves. Oh, by myself. <laughs> don't want to lead. Thank you. Appreciate that. Com- complimentary laugh over there. It's like, <laughs> Like I said to you, there's a difference between having your finger on the pulse and having your finger in the pot. The apostles realized this in Acts chapter 6 when they were serving tables. They said, it is not right for us to be spending the bulk of our time serving and waiting on tables. Let's appoint seven men. 
full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. Yeah. And we'll appoint them, lay hands on them so that we can carry on doing the work of the ministry. Amen? Yeah. I mean, there's a season of that sort of stuff there, but you know what? We need to know when to let go of things. There's a power in letting go. Amen? I mean, we learnt it from Frozen. Let it go. Let it go. Right? Sometimes you've just got to let it go. Amen? I'm going to hold on a little longer than it's supposed to be held on to. I mean, Paul even said, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Yeah. It isn't just forgetting the bad things. It's just sometimes you just got to let go of stuff. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We've, got to, we've got to move forward. We've got to keep on moving forward. Moses, by releasing, also increased his capacity. He still spoke into the life of the leaders. Yeah. Jethro said, you still need to address the people. You still need to teach them the statutes. You still need to teach them the laws. You still need to exhort them to be better people. That's the whole lot. But he said, you need to release certain positions of authority. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it expands your capacity. Guess what? If you're faithful and little, the reward is more. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. When the guy comes back and says, hey, I took the two talents you gave me. I made four. He goes, well done, good and faithful servant. Maintain. No, he says, I'm going to give you double. Yeah. Double cities, double responsibility. Yeah. Come on, man. You do good in what you're doing. God's going to give you more to do. Yeah. That's not to kill you. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I was dying already. Now he's going to run more. <laughs> Expand your capacity. Stretch forth your tense yeah, good, man. Very good. Talking to Paul before. You know, sometimes we, we've got things that are locked up inside of us that are dormant that will never be discovered until you come under pressure. Yeah. You've got gifts on your life right now that need to come out. And they're not going to come out by gentle Jesus, meek and mild. They need the line of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. Not Lamb of God just going, he needs to go, Rawr! So you go, yeah. Come on, man. He was called the Rock of Salvation. He was called the Rock of Offense. Yeah. Rock of Salvation wasn't Christians, Rock of Offense with non-Christians. It was the both. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And sometimes he wants to stir up those gifts. He'll put you through. He'll allow you to go through situations, not beyond your measure, because he says he will never allow anything to come upon you that doesn't provide a way out or a way through. Yeah. But too many times we're looking for a way out instead of a way through. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not escape it. Yeah, good. He said through the valley of the shadow of death. Number one, it's only a shadow, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Just means there's something between you and the light. Yeah, yeah. It's not real. Amen? But he said, I'm walking through it. Calmness of mind. Peace in my spirit. I'm taking everything in. He didn't say, yay, though I run like a sissy girl screaming all the way through the valley of the shadow of death. He also didn't say, yay, though I build my house and live in the valley of the shadow of death. I'm walking through it. There's a process. Some of you are going through something because chances are you possibly asked Jesus Christ for it. God, teach me to be a better person with my finances. Okay, I'm going to make you broke. Yeah. You'll soon learn. Come on, folks. Yeah, okay. Blame him for answering your prayer. Some of you are asking to make him, I want to be more like Jesus. You, you, you're asking a scary prayer, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think it's just about walking on water? Yeah. Multiplying McDonald's? Yeah. It means your friends are going to betray you, stab you in the back. Yeah. Welcome to Jesus' territory. Yeah. Sing beautiful songs. Want you to break me. What a, what a crazy song. <laughs> and we sing it with a melody. <laughs> Want you to break me. And God's up there going, look at that. You never want us to break them. Isn't that lovely? Jesus, give me a hand. Smash! <laughs> when you do great... God rewards us with greater. Not to bore you out, but to expose your capacity. Now, I'm going to finish in a few minutes. I have no idea how long I've gone. Steve will tell me. He'll give me the wave and go, get off. <laughs> Is this okay, folks? Are you okay? <laughs> Listen to what he says here. Exodus 21, 18, 21. It says, but select capable men. This is from the NIV. But, ex- but select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Now listen to the special qualifications that he said about picking men. He says, number one, they have to be capable. It means they have to have ability. Okay, having ability. Number two, they have to fear God, which means they're spiritual. Amen? Number three, they're trustworthy, they're honest, and they're integral. And number four, they hate dishonest gain. They're not driven by money or just profile. Yeah. Amen? Some leaders that, yeah, I mean, obviously, we don't pay volunteer leaders. We don't go, here, bless you. 
take your take your hand in, you know, put your hand in the plate and take what you feel you would. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's, it's just, it, but this other game, my name's not mentioned enough. I want prestige, I want status. Does that make sense? Yeah. But notice he said, capable, fear God, trustworthy, and hate dishonest game. But he never once said perfect. Very good. Very good. He never once said flawless. Yeah. He never once said sinless. Yeah. Now come on, folks. Yeah. Now some of us, the moment I mention the word sinless, we think of the worst sins. Yeah. What is the worst sin? There is no such thing. Yeah. I say, I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But sin is sin is sin. Yeah. A liar and a murderer go to the same place. Yeah. There's not a lighter shade of hell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can go to the comfortable hell. Yeah. Because you were just a liar. Yeah. However, the murderer, yeah, no, you're over there. Just hell. So you need to understand, it didn't mention flawless. It didn't, it didn't mention perfection. And sometimes we can make leadership or when we're selecting or discipling people underneath us, we're looking for perfection. Yeah. Friends, listen to me. And I mean this with all love, honor and respect as a pastor. When you're looking for perfection in other leaders, first look in the mirror. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And then go, okay, maybe I don't need perfect. <laughs> Come on, folks. Yeah. So I look in the mirror, there's flaws, man. You know what I mean? I look in the spiritual mirror, there are flaws. See, responsibility should not just be shared with anybody, obviously. There are qualifications, as he said, capable, fear God, trustworthy, honest, uh, hate dishonest game, right? But the thing is, this is, he didn't say perfect. You just need to simply look through the word of God to see that God didn't necessarily pick perfect people. Come on, Moses was a murderer. Yeah. Noah saves the planet. What's the first thing he does after saving the planet? He plants grapes and gets drunk. And dances around his house naked. Has anybody read the scripture here? <laughs> I'm going, I'm going, yeah, ha! I saved the world, yo. Dancing naked in his bedroom. Booyah. <laughs> you know, I don't know what he was doing. But remember the brother, the son comes in and sees him. Goes outside, dad is naked. Booyah. Twitter, Instagram. <laughs> the other two sons come in. They come in with a blanket, walk in backwards and cover him over. The thing is this, he was an ordinary person. See, those type of people, he struggled with different stuff. David, man, premeditated murder. Yeah. Come on, folks. I mean, stared at a naked lady. I mean, he committed the first internet porn. Because he looked at a naked lady through windows. <laughs> Some of you didn't get that, okay. So I'll get Craig to explain that later on, IT guy. Okay, please. But he was called a man after God's own heart after that. After that, folks. Yeah. Wasn't similar. Solomon, they called him wise. 700 wives. Yeah. Wise? <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Serious. But he had issues. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Which way is Nineveh God? It's that way. So Jonah went, woof, and took up this way. <laughs> Wasn't right. Sarah laughed, scoffed. Me, pregnant? You know how old I am? What a joke. Come on, folks. Abraham lied. Not once, not twice, but three times. Now, she's not my wife. She's my sister. Yeah. Totally don't. She's my sister. Do whatever. <coughs> Come on, he lied. Don't call it a holy lie. It's a lie. Yeah. Yeah. He, God even had Pharaoh rebuke him. Yeah. God will use anybody. Yeah, it's a... God used a donkey. He, all, he, all, he always uses donkeys. <laughs> I know that's Old Testament, right? Let's flip through the New Testament. Peter. <coughs> Peter was a foul mouthed fisherman. Swearing at everything. Get angry with people, cut people's ears off. Rebuke God. Yeah. Not so, Lord. I mean, he went from being called Peter the Rock to Satan in five verses. Yeah. <laughs> That's an incredible demotion. <laughs> Thomas doubted everything. Judas is stealing money. And Jesus picks these guys as disciples. James and John, power trippers, get their mum to do the talking from. Yeah. Yeah. Can my boy stand on your left and right side? <laughs> See, can we read scripture here? Yeah. I was just, I was just staring at me like I'm <laughs> preaching to a television on mute. You're like... I can't hear any sounds. <laughs> Paul had insecurities. New Testament's full of ordinary people. 
Struggled, man. Half the church in the book of Acts was birthed out of argument. Because the disciples couldn't get on together. They had sharp disputes and separated ways. Amen? Some of you may be even a part of this church right now because you had a bad run-in with your previous church. But now here you are growing. I smell God. Because sometimes we think it's only God going, no, you must go, brother. I send you with the blessing and Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ. The senior pastor went, amen. We reverent that. We send you with a love gift. No, there was a big argument. Friction happened. You left, and now you're coming to a church and you're growing. Sometimes God has his finger in on those stuff. Come on, folks. Oh, some of you need to read about that, right? Read the book of Acts. It'll encourage you. But see, you need to understand. God was looking for ordinary people to do extraordinary things. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26 to 31 says this. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us the wisdom of God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. God is just looking for ordinary people. You and I need to open up our eyes and look for the ordinary people that have an if only. That are just looking for an opportunity. Give them an opportunity to even mess up. In your home groups, it's a great safe place to mess up. When I ran my first connect group, my first home group many, many years ago, we had the craziest bunch of people in the world. This guy used to give false prophecies all the time, man. I mean, it was so heretical and you'd have to re-guide him, but man, I loved his spirit. (laughs) He'd get up sometimes in the middle of worship, God's called us all to be like like scud missiles, just blowing up everywhere. Now, scud missile has no direction, it's a random rocket. And I thought, yeah, that's probably not right. But God bless him for trying. I had a hippie chick that used to lead worship and used to wear bells on her ankles and, and wrists. And it used to annoy me. Because you couldn't hear the music, but you just hear tickle, tickle, tickle. Because she, she was quite a moving person. And I used to think, take the bells off! I'll smash you! One time I'm, I'm driving home, having a complaint session with my worship guy. And I'm going, I wish that she could take those stupid bells off. She annoys me. Manifesting. Yeah, it happens. And the guy turned around and goes, yeah, but don't you worship God? Yeah. And I went, shut up! <laughs> you idiot! Agree with me! It's just pure potential. He saw what I wasn't looking at. I remember asking a person once to say grace, and they freaked out and left the connect group for three weeks because I didn't give them enough notice. <laughs> because they were terrified. They wanted to say grace, but you have to give them at least three days' notice. You want me to say thank you, Father, for the food? What, now? <laughs> and they froze. But there was potential in them. First time I ever led praise at a home group, man, I wrote out every song, every song, and I was singing each one three and a half times, so I wrote it out three and a half times so there could be no mistakes. And I rehearsed in front of the mirror all week. I fasted for the three days leading up to the home group. Fa- full fast. I was terrified. I've been leading hand moves my signals. I gave it to the musician. We did rehearsal after rehearsal. I think the musician went, Oh, shut up, man. Three songs. I think I led it and I, I blew it. You know what I mean? I'm thinking, Read the sheets. Read the sheets. <laughs> Raise your hands. Clap. You know. But there was a paranoia, but what people saw in me was a potential. They look beyond the scars. They look beyond the flaws. They look beyond those things there. What are you looking for? Are you finding the diamond in the rough? Or are you just looking for the diamonds? Come on, we've got to learn to develop people. See, we've got to give people responsibility. Responsibility given and authority to make decisions. We've got to train people up. You know, I was looking at this, right? If you give responsibility without authority, it will equate frustration. People will get very frustrated. If you give responsibility with authority but no accountability, you'll create loose cannons. You'll create potential problems. You'll definitely create division. But responsibility with authority and accountability equals covering. It equals discipleship. It equals 
was. Right. Amen? I'm just going to finish with this. Actually, no, I, I, gotta, I just got to hit two things. Is that okay? Yeah. Sorry, man. I just, I, see, because I was thinking about this, right? Moses had to pick people, leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, right? Now, think about this. There were at least 600,000 men at this time. 600,000 men, not including women and children, right? So this means that he had to pick, listen to this, he had to pick, listen, one out of every five rulers was a, rule, was a ruler of ten. Uh, right, and listen to this, right, since there were 600,000 males, there were about 60,000 rulers of ten. One of every five rulers of ten was a ruler of fifty. That would make another 12,000 rulers of fifty. Every second ruler of fifty was a ruler of hundred, about 6,000 of these. And every tenth ruler of a hundred was a ruler of thousand, so there were about 600 of those. So in total, there were 78,600 leaders that needed to be appointed. How many people know there's no way in the world that I believe Moses hand-selected every one of them? There is no way. Even if he had a half an hour appointment with each person, it would have taken a couple of years. Think about that. So in other words, he had to trust in people to pick people. Amen? And that's what has to happen in a healthy church. There's an impartation for impartation. There's a delegation for delegation. There's a discipleship for discipleship. Does this make sense? And everybody has the ability to be able to do that. See, this is where the challenge comes to you and I. We need to begin to select. And you know, there's a danger. What if you pick a leader of 10 that really has the capacity to lead a 1,000? Well, they're going to get bored, but they'll do an awesome job. The scarier part is, what if you pick a leader of a thousand that only has the capacity to be ten? Yeah. You're going to have a mutiny. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Nine hundred and ninety people are going to go. I'm out of here. Do you understand? So what we need to apply is this: we need to apply faith, we need to apply wisdom, but we definitely need to apply risk. There still has to be risk. There has to be a risk. Jesus. Jesus, even though, yes, he knew absolutely everything, he took risks with the disciples that he picked. We would not have any of his disciples even as our life group leaders. Yeah. We wouldn't. Yeah. We've just we've aimed for perfection. We, if we saw someone dipping into the money jar, we wouldn't appoint him an apostle. Yeah. We wouldn't send him out to heal the sick because we'd be too afraid to rob them. Yeah. Do you understand? But there is an element of faith. Absolutely. God, show me. Show me the diamonds in the rough. There's wisdom in making your selections so that you can actually note things and listen to what God's speaking to you about. But there still is always going to be the element of risk. There is going to be the element. What if it doesn't work out? So? What if it doesn't work out? Learn. Process it. Don't just cut the person off. But we talk through the process. Amen? There has to be that element of risk. There always is. People take a risk. Someone took a risk on you. Yeah, good. Very good. When was the last time you took a risk on someone? Everybody. There are Timothys right now waiting to be discipled by you. I was taught a long time ago, you need three people in your life. You need a Timothy, someone you're discipling. You need a Barnabas, someone that comes alongside you and encourages you. And you need a Solomon, someone that's speaking wisdom into your life. The problem is we have a lot of Solomons and we have a lot of Barnabases, but we're not bringing up any Timothys. Yes, good. Come on. The youngest Christian in this place is still has the ability to disciple somebody. Yeah, great. Teach them something. You know, Adrian and I were talking last night. He says, what would you give me feedback on? I said, set your generals, the people that actually create such a positive peer pressure. During the preaching, get them set up all around the auditorium, sitting in their different areas and the different aisles, creating spot fires. Let's create a positive peer pressure amongst the unsaved that are coming along when they hear the word of God. So they'll actually have to be, they'll have to do their utmost to escape positive peer pressure. Yeah. Because when they walk out of here, they're going to get peer, peer pressure. Peer, pre, peer, 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 peer pressure. Let's bring in positive peer pressure in this place here. Amen. Set them up. That's the bottom line. We have to, we have the ability to be able to disciple people all the time. The last thing I want to finish is Moses exhibited the qualities of a great leader. Why? Because a good leader will consider his limitations. And he did. He listened and he considered. A good leader will take the advice and use it. A good leader realizes some work is more important than others. And a good leader will still have plenty to do even after the work has been shared. The moment you begin to discover that you can actually hand things over, you'll begin to discover something about yourself that you never saw. 
It wasn't until I let go of certain stuff that God began to refill my hands with even more. And the problem is some of us are holding on to something so tightly that God can't give you anything more. You're asking for increase. Where does he put it? Where does he put it? When your hands are clenched around the gift you have right now. There's a great story of a certain monkey that grows in, uh, lives in South America. And it's, it's on the endangered species list right now. And the problem is the park rangers, people that are assigned over the park, they have to inoculate it because there's diseases being brought in that are killing these monkeys as well. But to catch these little monkeys is really hard. They're fast, they're nimble, they're agile, and they're worried about injuring them, trying to shoot them with these darts. So they went to the local natives that live in that area, and they said, listen, man, you lived here, how do you catch these things? They said, well, watch this. And they take this coconut or this nut, and they drill a hole in it, and they empty it out. And the hole's a small hole, and then they fill it with the fruits that are the favorite, monkey's favorites. And then they nail it to a tree, or they weight it down, and then leave it on the ground. And these monkeys come in, and they stick their hand through the hole, and they begin to grab the fruit. But then when they go to pull their fist out, they can't get their fist out. <coughs> and the monkey will not let go. Yeah. And so he's dragging this nut around, can't get up in the trees, or he's stuck on the tree going, eek, eek, eek. And the native just walks up and grabs it. Because the monkey's not letting go of this stuff. This is my stuff. It's mine. If I let this go, I'm, I'm stuffed. They're your stuff. So the monkey's like, ah, ah, ah. The native goes, here you go. We're like that monkey. We keep on holding on to our stuff. We keep on holding on to our fruit. It's mine. And God's gone, but I've got so much more for you. If you'd only let go. If you'd only let go, I'll refill your hands with something that'll blow your mind. Come on, folks. Is that cool? We've got to learn to empty our hands. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to this leadership team, Lord God. Father, I thank you, Father, for the youngest to the oldest leader in this place, Lord God. The ones that have been serving just a short time to the ones that have been serving for, for, forever, Lord God. Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, even as we have learned these lessons from, from Moses, Lord God. Father, the good, the bad, and the ugly, Lord God. Father, I just pray let us glean off of it. Lord God, Father, we thank you that you've given us an opportunity to learn from another man's experience. Lord God, Father, but Lord, I pray for every single person in here. God, give us the vulnerability. Give us the openness, at least towards you, to grow in this area, Father God. Wherever it is that you may be challenging us, whatever it is that you, we may be holding on to, Father God. Lord, we want to relinquish it and let it go to you. It belongs to you anyway. And Father God, we just lift our hands again to you empty, Lord God. Father, saying, here we are. Lord, I pray that even now you begin to remind people in this place of the very first day that you called them. The very first day that they maybe bowed their knee and they said, here I am, Lord, send me. Lord, if you can use anyone, Lord God, use me. Lord God, I pray that you would remind people of that prayer. Let them know that, Father God, even for some, they may say that was years ago. To you, it was but a moment in time. It was like it was said just yesterday. It is as fresh and as alive now as it was the very first day they said it, Lord God. I pray rekindle that fire, Lord, even as you reminded Timothy through Paul that it was his responsibility to fan into flame the gift of God that is in him. It wasn't someone else's responsibility. It was our own personal responsibility to fan into flame the gift of God that is placed inside of them, Lord God. Father, I pray stir it up. In each and every one of us, Lord God, we want to continue to grow. Father, from this moment on, we know that in Moses' life, Lord God, that his leadership grew to exponential capacity, Lord God. Through the releasing, Lord God, there was a strengthening. There was a renewing. There was a refreshing, Lord God. And Father, I speak it over every leader in this place right now. I speak that refreshing. In fact, right now, my heads are bowed and eyes are closed. There are people in here, you feel a little tired and weary. That's understandable. But you know what? God wants to bring refreshing right now. He wants to bring refreshing right now. He says that he gives his blessed children rest. 
It's a command from God. And while heads are bowed, eyes closed, if that's you in this place, just raise your hand because I want to pray for you. We thank you, Lord God. Father, you see these hands that are raised, Lord God. Father, I pray right now that you would just put upon them commanded rest. I pray that you would begin to drop in keys into their spirit, Lord God, on how they can rest in your presence, Father God. Lord, if you're calling them to equip others, if you're calling them to be better at delegating, Lord God, if you're calling them, Lord God, to uh, relieve themselves of certain responsibilities, Lord God, I pray that you would speak to them in such a way that they would know that it is nothing but the voice of God speaking to them. And Lord God, I pray right now for a commanded rest to come upon them, Lord God. Father, even your son pulled aside the disciples and took them to a quiet place where they could get some rest. Lord God, I speak over these young men and women, the older men and women in this place right now that hands are raised. God, give them that commanded rest. Father God, even your youths grow tired and weary. But Lord, you said that as we wait on you, You'll renew our strength. You'll cause us to rise up like eagles. To run and not grow weary. To walk and not faint. Father God, I speak that over them right now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord God. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this church. I thank you you for what you're going to continue to do, Lord God. I thank you that, Father God, one day this place will be filled multiplied times. Lord God, that, Father, even on a leadership meeting, this sanctuary will be filled with new leaders, Father God, that are sitting even in our church right now. That come to church on Sunday, come to youth on Friday. Lord God, they are here right now, Lord God. Give us the eyes to see. Give us the faith Speak to us with wisdom, Holy Spirit, and give us their boldness to take the risks. We thank you now, God, for the opportunity to serve you in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. We just need Pastor Matt real quick. What an amazing word. So I guess my, my challenge to you guys is how are you going to go out and multiply yourself? How are you going to go out and take this? And how are you going to grow beyond yourself? How are you going to delegate? Who are you going to target? How are you going to increase your capacity by bringing someone else into the fold? Amen? That's the end of our time. We have gone a little bit later than I said we would, but that's all right. You guys don't care, eh? It's all good. Pastor Matt's going to be here tomorrow. It's our Father's Day service. It's going to be huge. So... I want to, I've invited personally 12 people, all right? I want to challenge you to invite somebody, get somebody here. I, I don't care if they're a man, woman, anybody. I'm just like, you need to come to our Father's Day service tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, even Pastor Matt hooked me up with one, and the, there was one in the uh, shoe shop yesterday. We're walking past, and uh, her boyfriend used to come to Elam Summer and like, well, you guys need to get to church on Sunday. So I encourage you today, go invite someone to church tomorrow, Father's Day service. Matt, Pastor Matt's going to be preaching. We've got a whole lot of fun stuff going on, giveaways. We're going to have a beard off. Uh, there's going to be a Ferrari in the building. It's going to be amazing. So make sure you, you invite someone. Get here early. Uh, we want to pack this place out. This whole weekend for us is about creating noise and momentum to lift us to the next level that God's got for us, okay? So get people here. Everyone with a pulse needs to be in this building, all right? Fingers on the pulse. All right, go. Have an awesome day. Be blessed. Grab a coffee. We'll see you tomorrow.